Welcome to the podcast today. My name is Douglas Gabriel. I'm here with my good friend, John Barnwell, and we're going to be discussing how to become an angel, which is, I think, something very apropos in our age. Welcome, John. Well, hello, Douglas. And uh, before we roll into this, I just want to share something because I think it's it's important to understand that that what we're putting forward here is a core uh, level of Christianity leading all the way back to the ninth century and uh, the school that was in the Carolingian court and the events that were described so wonderfully by our mentor, Werner Glass's mentor, uh, Walter Johannes Stein, and that there are certain key events surrounding what is called the Grail that harkens back to the early Christianity that preceded uh, like uh, the fourth century and the whole concept that surrounds the, the idea of the Logos and that in the Gospel of John it says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. And from there, the first 14 verses are a wonderful Rosicrucian meditation. But uh, Rudolf Steiner says, the apostles should not talk about the highest knowledge outdoors. They should dress this knowledge in simple words, but they themselves should be perfect. Therefore, we see those who should be bearers of the word of God teaching a truthful theosophy spreading a truthful theosophical teaching. Take and understand the words of Paul, understand the words of Dionysius the Areopagite, and then Johannes Scotus Irugina, who taught in his book, De Divisione Naturae, or on the division of nature, the sevenfold nature of the human being, like all theosophists. Then you know that their interpretation of Christianity was identical with that of theosophy. Indeed, uh, in the Carolingian court, it was uh, Pseudo-Dionysus, the Areopagite's work that was translated and brought to uh, the Western world and taught the nine hierarchies. And to teach the nine hierarchies, you must understand a cosmology, and it's impossible to understand it without realizing Christ is at the core. So what we're talking about today, if we're going to talk about angels, then we need to talk about probably all nine ranks of the angels with all their different names and the trinity that's above them and the fact that we are the 10th hierarchy, but we're not angels yet. But that's what the divine plan says. Even John Barnwell, even Douglas Gabriel is going to turn into an angel if we follow the right path. But what's the right path? And so what we have done here, I, I want to throw a little uh, background history here of how the, this new book, How to Become an Angel Preparing for the Sixth and Seventh Epoch. And the word epoch is key here. <laughs> and we're going to come back to that and talk about that and have a good laugh about that. But the question is, why would I write a book about this? Why would we write a book about this? And and. All I can say is that after all the things that I have written, it came down to, well, I need to take the prophecies of Rudolf Steiner and carry them out in a timeline in the future so that people know what it is that they are to become. Now, as Stephen Covey says in the um, the highly effective habits of uh, or the seven habits of highly effective people, you begin with the end in mind. So if you're beginning now on your path or on, you're far along on the path, what is it you're aiming for? What's that look like? And so then one can say, well, let's look at Rudolf Steiner. He has predicted the future and he has predicted many, many, many things. So I started to write an article on his prophecies. And I started off with things like the fact that he pointed out where the galactic center was, the supergalactic center, that light can travel faster than the speed of the frontal motion of light, that the center of mass of our uh, solar system is not on the sun, but it's a dynamic point between the inner three planets and the outer three planets uh, in relationship to the sun. And so all these different prophecies I started to write down 
and grab from different things, astronomy and other places. And so I, this article got so huge, I had to break it apart. And so then I said, well, what am I going to do? First, if I'm going to describe these prophecies for the future, we have to lay the groundwork for the past so that people understand where things came from. Well, that gets complicated. If you go to one of my talks on the um, Akashic talks, the one on cosmology, you can get a description there of the way that our solar system came to be. And it's we call a Christian cosmology. Now, if you compare that to modern science, there's sections of it that Rudolf Steiner point, points out, this is how we go from one incarnation of the earth or planetary incarnation, he calls it, to the next. And when this happens, there is a, a period in between, John, do you pronounce it Pralaya or Pralaya? Pralaya. Pro, yeah, but, like but Maya. The, you know, it yeah. depends on if you're American or British. So when you say Pralaya, what you're talking about is the chrysalis state between a caterpillar and a butterfly where everything goes into a what Rudolf Steiner calls a revolution of the elements or what he calls a great cataclysm. And so at the end of Atlantis, there was a great cataclysm and Atlantis is now the uh, at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, more or less, the landmass that was there. But we know that these things happen. There's a dynamic expression of the stages uh, being manifested in the way that the continents have divided and continue to divide. But only Rudolf Steiner describes these things. And the great thing about Steiner is when you start to write down his predictions, you get a whole lot of predictions that have yet to come to pass. And then what are you going to do with that? Well, what you can do is you can create a very clear description of what most of the anthroposophists in their spare time do to create charts like this. Now, I'm not, I'm not gonna show you this chart too clearly because that's not the point. The point is, you see this chart? That's called the divine plan. That's seven stages of consciousness and the seven stages of life inside of those stages and the seven stages of form inside of those stages. So 343 stages in this divine plan and Rudolf Steiner describes all of them. And so if he is correct in the past, then what would uh, keep him from being correct in the future? And so we tried to do something that was never has never been done before. And that's right there. You see the charts I showed? The seven charts that are in the diagrams in this book, How to Become an Angel, Preparing for the Sixth and Seventh Epoch. John created those. John is the master chart maker. And he has been working on these things uh, uh, for longer than most of us have been alive. And we took the Pfeiffer charts and he put them into his book, The Arcana, The Grail Angel, and his second book also. And those charts are the most valuable thing that you can get as a visual stimulation to explicate the divine plan. Now, how many charts are in there? Oh, just more than you can count. How many charts are in here? John has distilled this down into, I think, seven diagrams as well as there's a bunch of charts and tables that are in, in this book, uh, How to Become an Angel. Again, I'll show the book, How to Become an Angel. This is on Amazon. This is our second book that came out. And there's more chart diagrams. Now, these tell you about the different, what we call, what Steiner calls, incarnations of the earth. Now, that's a little dicey. Right there, you, you're going to start getting a little freaked out if you are not an anthroposophist, seasoned anthroposophist, when you start talking about the incarnations of the earth, old Saturn, old sun, old moon, and now we're in the incarnation of the earth called the earth. But in the future, there's three more called Jupiter, or what we call future Jupiter, future Venus, future Vulcan. So there's seven incarnations of the earth. Okay, now that's further than anybody in astrophysics, anybody in astronomy, anybody in any field of study has ever gone. Now, you can get all this clearly described by Steiner's um, secretary, one of his secretaries, but this was his main secretary and his name was Gunther Voxmuth. 
And in the old days, if you were lucky enough to come across this book, The Evolution of Mankind, Cosmic Evolution, Incarnation on the Earth, The Great Migration, Spiritual History. If you can get this book, which is almost impossible to get, they don't print it anymore because they say there's a couple mistakes in it. But if you study this, you will have the clearest history of the cultural development of human humankind and the relationship to astrological time periods and then these periods that Steiner gives these different names for. Now, that's very good, but you can't get that book. And so, of course, John and I have studied that book thoroughly, but you can get a great book right now. So if you think that what we're saying and about what I'm about to say is completely crazy, it has been proven to down to the dotted I's and the cross T's within a book called this book right here. The Mutual Evolution of Earth and Humanity, Sketch of a Geology and Paleontology of the Living Earth by Dankmar Bosi. Now, I've tried to get people to read this book, but it is one of the most difficult books you can possibly read unless you're a, a, a geologist. And if you do, you will get descriptions in here of the way our solar system came into existence and the way it manifested even in the metals, the minerals, the exact creation of the substances of the planets, everything is in there. The past. I cannot hold a book up to you that describes the future in the same way, using the same charts, using the same proofs, the same geological time periods. All like Atlantis has been proven, whether people want to acknowledge it or not. And so has Lemuria. And so has the fact that the moon came out of the earth. And when I say that, you're going to go, okay, flat earth is going to be the next thing this guy's going to bring up. No, 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 no. The real scientists know for a fact that the substances that are on the moon are the hardest substances that were in the earth. And many of those metals and minerals don't exist in the earth, or if they do, they're not in the crust of the earth. So why were they all put into one place and sent into a satellite that happens to match the exact diameter and the, it can cover the sun in a perfect eclipse so that it's that exact degree in relationship to the earth, rotating around the earth, so that it could then be in complete coincidence with the sun, the sun, the moon, the earth. So how do these things happen? And, and if these things are true, what we're saying that there was an Atlantis, the Lemuria, the moon came out of the earth, and that the prior manifestation of our solar system is as Rudolf Steiner describes it, then what he describes for the future is true also. And that's what I set out to do. And I found out it was next to impossible. Uh, my brain broke a few times. I gave up on the project. I think it was the longest article, the longest time I ever spent on an article in my entire life. Still couldn't write the article. Broke it into three parts, broke it into four parts. And so in the future, on our next talk, we're going to be talking about the uh, the next book that's coming out in the series called Surviving the Apocalypse, Building Your Own Ark. Well, that gives you very clear details of the near future. But what we're going to talk about today is the far past and the far future because there's no time and there's no space when you become an angel. Angels don't live in time and space. That's just a fact. And anything that you think in your mind, if I say, what's an angel? If you see an image, that's not an angel. Okay, you can't create an image of God or an angel, or an archangel or an archive. You can look at their influences, but when you do, it will be a global influence. It won't be an influence just with one particular person. All the hierarchy, the nine angelic hierarchy are all working together. And if they rebel, then they're fallen hierarchy. And that's how matter was created. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But the point is, I had to come to John and say, John, will you please help me with this project? Because Rudolf Steiner, uh, as we were working on this book, literally, let me just name some of the periods and some of the nomenclature used. Period, era, epoch, sub-epoch, planetary incarnation, incarnation of the earth, uh, eras, sub-epoch, uh, I said sub sub-races, uh, root races, races. Ages. Ages, periods, times. I, we were on one paragraph and it broke both of our brains at the same time trying to get the nomenclature proper because we know what Steiner's saying, but the words don't say that. 
<laughs> so there have been some of the greatest anthroposophists who got this wrong. And that's the reason we put this book out so that it would be put in place and correct in the English speaking world in contradistinction to what the previous British translators and the German translators have given us, which is a mishmash that literally you can understand why even the, the, the great anthroposophist never spoke of this, never. What we're gonna to say today has never been spoken about by any anthroposophist that I know of, not even Sergei Pikoviev, T.H. Meyer, none of them. None of them will go near this stuff, why? Because it seems so, um, I don't know, dramatic, gigantic. To get your mind wrapped around this is one of the most difficult things in anthroposophy. Yes, I mean, when, when you, uh, what William Blake called the fearful symmetry, is that when you start to contemplate the cosmos and you, and you realize like some of the things like, why is the moon exactly the right size for an eclipse? And then if you look in the cycle of the procession of the equinox, which uh, generates the ages that we'll be referring to, those ages are 2,160 years. Now it's said in certain circles that the mile is actually a, a cosmic uh, system of distance. And it's interesting to note that the diameter of the moon is 2,160 miles. So there's, there's all these coincidences, shall we say, that, that couldn't have occurred in a random universe. The, the 28 year cycle of, or 28 uh, day cycle of the moon and, and how that finds a correspondence with the roughly 28 year cycle of the outer planet Saturn. And so there's all these levels of, of cosmology that interlock, that are a part of the destiny of mankind. Uh, your modern secular individuals tend to exclude almost everything except for that, which is of a material nature. And within spiritual science and within Christianity as a whole, going all the way back, to the early centuries when, when Paul converted Dionysius in Athens and Demaris, the woman he names, it's what in chapter, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, what, verse 34, I believe. But uh, he became the first bishop of Athens. And in the sixth century, the writings surfaced. And he's sometimes referred to as pseudo Dionysius, because it, it's obviously written in sixth century Greek. But Rudolf Steiner says, well, that's, yeah, it was written down then, but this was a tradition going back, and it was the nature of traditions that leaders of the school would take on the name of their predecessor, so that all the leaders of the school, the esoteric Christian school of Dionysius, the school established by Paul, is leading back to that whole idea of the nine hierarchical beings and how they play into uh, the manifesting and formative aspects of the world in which we live. And if you go back to Johannes Scotus Irigina, uh, jo John the Scot, he came from the great Christian schools that were in Ireland. It's that Celtic Christianity that got pushed aside by the, the lawyers of the Roman church uh, to a large extent, but yet there's this what's called exodus at reditus, and it has to do with the exit and the return. And it, it's such a beautiful concept because when you get into studying what Douglas has put together here with the cycles of ages and how a planetary condition comes into being and then goes into pralaya which it means it goes out of its manifest form and then re-manifests on the next stage of evolution. What is that but an exit and a return? And so you have this book that, that uh, is written by this guy in the ninth century who uh, is considered by many people, I mean, uh, the what the philosopher, what's his name? I, I can't think of it right now, uh, Bertrand, Bertrand Russell, yeah, he said, the most astonishing person of the ninth century. 
Here you have this singular individual, and he's giving you the core of anthroposophy. But it's such a difficult read. It's like kind of like reading Fichte or Hegel or any of the other esoteric sources. And so what we try to do is take these types of views and, and make it easier to understand. And, and Douglas is really a master of that because he's a master teacher in Waldorf education. And so we hope that we can help you on your journey. So let's start the journey off with the pendulum. Okay, we have a pendulum. I wish I would have brought one. Okay, and the pendulum starts at one point and it goes down, dips down, and then comes up. And then it takes the energy and goes back. And then if you start to, it's very strange. Pendulums do amazing things. I won't go there. But the point is that if you start with the pendulum, it's falling down into matter. And these are the first three incarnations of the earth. And then it reaches the low point. That's the earth. And then it starts up and there's the fifth, sixth, and seventh. And then it's going to basically, the pendulum's not a good image. There are no good images and there's no good charts and there's no good tables. It's, it has to be sense-free thinking. It has to be super sensible perception for you to understand what I'm saying. But if you look at even a plant and the growth of a plant, or as we describe in the book, The Eternal Ethers, if you look at the growth of a caterpillar, especially a monarch into a a caterpillar to a monarch, it goes through these cycles of seven. And Rudolf Steiner said these are implicit in, in the table of elements, in the way, uh, in the types of trees there are, in the types of minerals, metals, everything. Everything's seven. So you have these seven stages. So we're in the fourth stage. Now, what happened in the first three stages? Well, that's when minerals, plants, and animals were created. Who created them? Well, this is when it gets complicated. <laughs> the second, the signer always says, as you know, in ancient Saturn, ancient sun, and ancient moon, it was the Curiotes working with the Archai in ancient set. And then he goes into exactly which of the higher hierarchies and the other lower hierarchies, still higher than us, work together in the ancient period of the first period to create warmth with the Archai working through the really the direction of the thrones and the wisdom of the curiotities. So, uh, but what's happening there is those archai are going to evolve. All the angels and all the nine ranks evolve through this. So it, you could stop me at any point and go, well, well, but wait, you're not being detailed enough to state that the warmth that was created on ancient Saturn now becomes the minerals on earth after it goes through the three stages. Then in the fourth stage, during a recapitulation of these three previous stages, minerals, plants, and animals came in a new form, like out of a chrysalis, like a butterfly coming out of the chrysalis in the earth incarnation. Well, that's only the beginning. And then there's seven other stages inside of that. Mo the first two of those stages, human scientists don't understand at all. Polaria, hyperborea, they're going to go, what are you talking about? And if I described them to you, you'd go, okay, that sounds kind of crazy. Then there's Lemuria. And then there's Atlantis. As you know, the scientists won't even give credence to the fact that they have proof of Atlantis. They have proof of Lemuria by studying the plants and animals. Where did they come from? They came for all from a source that is no longer there. Well, where'd the source go? Why is it that ancient civilizations are wiped out completely without any record and we don't have a clue and when we find a clue, we can't even interpret it? Because that's that dynamic change between a caterpillar and a butterfly and the, and, and the chrysalis. And in a way you go through that in each of these stages, sometimes in a major level, sometimes in more of a minor level. But that's what we are now, we are the accumulation of the archai, the archangels, and the angels laying down for us the mineral, plant, and uh, animal, the basis of their kingdoms. Not as we see it now, because even if you go to ancient moon, which is the closest one to us, you start to describe that. It was a fluid state. There were no minerals. There was nothing solid. One couldn't even say there was any, if there was nothing solid, then the fluid wasn't really quite what we would call fluid. And what was going on there? You had, uh, in that point, angels experiencing what is called their human stage. Now, what does that mean? It means that they became personally identified with a substance 
that they used to push up against so that they could awaken themselves and advance. That's why we have minerals, plants, and animals, and why we have evil humans, and also all kinds of other spiritual beings who are good and evil coming into this realm, and we have to balance all of that. So we have going on right now the synchronicity of heterodyned donations, gifts, sacrifices, and fallen substance that have been prepared through three previous stages until we got to the fourth stage of earth. And if you can understand that and you have it and your brain hasn't gone to sleep or exploded, then we can start to look at three future stages because the next stage called future Jupiter is what we call heaven. And Rudolf Steiner points that out. It is literally what Christians call heaven. And he describes it in great detail how it's created, what it will look like, what will happen to human beings, the, the judgment of human beings, everything we see in the apocalypse from the uh, letters to the churches, to the um, vials of wrath, to the seals, to the trumpets. All of that is, is described in exact detail by Steiner and how it's going to look, how it's going to feel for human beings in the future. And so I'm, we're going to, uh, in this talk, talk more about that. But First, John, see if you can clean up what it is that I attempted to describe right there. <laughs> well, as you know, <laughs> with the old Saturn, old Sun, and old Moon conditions, that we are uh, human beings, and directly above us are angels, and above the angels are the archangels, and above the archangels are the archives. So all you need to do is go to Douglas's book and go in the back and look at the diagram of the seven planetary conditions. And you see that, that the old Saturn condition was when the archive went to their equivalent human stage, or what is for us a fourth stage. For them, that was their fourth condition. And then the old sun is when archangels went to their equivalent human stage and then old moon is where the angels went through their equivalent human stage and so you see that with each stage after going through palaya they move to the next level now those stages are accomplished by the donation from higher spiritual beings that donate out of their very substance to those beings now, there are a certain number of beings that reject that substance. And those are what are called the adversaries. And so you have Lucifer and Araman and the Asuras, for example. They have rejected that. But see, by rejecting the divine substance of the divine spiritual beings, they become merely put ideas. forward by the divine spiritual beings. I know these concepts that I presented are very difficult. Let me give you a simpler concept. There, according to Rudolf Steiner, are people who are cosmologists and people who are simply devoted people to Christ. So there are people like John and I who love to go into the details of these things and make sure that everything pans out, it all adds up. But for other people, a pure heart will get them to becoming an angel, literally. If we were to say, what is the bottom line? How do you become an angel? Very simple. You have a 100% pure heart, pure in everything that you do. And if you want to be a cosmologist, uh, like John and I both are, I'm kind of a unwilling cosmologist, but I have to be so that I can explain these things when people call up and say, do angels have feet? Do you really get your wings as an angel? Someone today, I ask a very Christian person, how do you become an angel? And he, and he said, well, you're right. You have to be righteous and you have to get up every day and do what you think is right. And I'm going, exactly. And then you get your wings. He goes, do clairvoyants really see wings on people? I said, yes, we do. <laughs> it blew his mind, right? Completely blew his mind. But what did the Greeks say? To rise into the realm of the archetypes, you, your soul gets its wings. And what is an archetype? Arch, archangel, archai. It is a cosmic being. 
Absolutely. And again, to, to try and, and clarify some of this is that we're looking at the divine nature being donated to beings that are, are, are beneath it. So on old Saturn, it was donated to the archive by the thrones and on old sun, it was donated to the archangels in their human stage and on old moon donated to the angels in their human stage. And on earth, we received the ego through uh, the deeds of Christ. And that is the important thing because that's something that you can either work with and align yourself with that uh, level of being that Douglas was just describing, or you can negate it and then you just end up at the end of Earth evolution being an unfulfilled idea. Which in the future, Rudolf Steiner says, nothing is ever wasted. There is no permanent hell. Uh, even the, um, the fiery lake, the second lake that you can be thrown into. Yes, it means that you won't get to finish your human development, but you're not going to be forgotten. You become nature spirits in the next divine plan. So when we're talking about the whole seven, that's the divine plan. And we're right in the middle. And the part that causes evolution and metamorphosis, like between a caterpillar, a chrysalis, and a butterfly, that is that state called uh, prolia. But what we're aiming for is the next incarnation of the earth when we are angels. We are literally going to become angels. Now, here's the sad news. Not everybody's going to become an angel. This is done out of free will. It's done if you can become selfless enough, like the Holy Grail, to hold the nourishment that gives warmth and light and love and nourishment to everyone that comes to the Grail. Whatever it is that you desire and you need, that's what the Grail gives you. That's what Christ gave when he was working from the realm just above the archai. The archai are the time spirits. Just above them, the spirits of form. Above them, the spirits of motion. Above them, the spirits of wisdom. Above them, the spirits of will. Above them, the spirits of harmony. Above them, the spirits of love. And they all have their names, Greek names. They have uh, descriptive names. Steiner gives all the names and describes them in the best fashion. As a matter of fact, if you take what Steiner has given us through anthroposophy, it is a more comprehensive Christian cosmology than any other that is available and in fact, prepares you to be able to communicate with these beings. And that's what we're talking about here. How do you become an angel? You learn their language. Steiner calls it the language of the spirit. You learn their divine plan. You learn how things are going to manifest. For instance, the archangels, every 360, between 300, 360 years or so, the archangel, the, one of the seven ruling archangels, rises up into the realm of the archai, the time spirits, and they become what's called the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. Right now, ours is the archangel Michael, who's the archai Michael, right now from 1879 into our period. And for 300 or so, 360 years, he brings his quality, and he's the quality of the sun. So each archangel has the quality of a planet. Well, Christ working from the Elohim and the seven leading Elohim, who each controls one of the seven planets. The sun is called a planet, kind of, in this system. The archangel of the sun, that is Michael. So right now, if you want to contact the archangel who's leading all of culture, you study Michael. You study the previous times that Michael has been the ruler. You study the cultural infusion that happened, the history that happened at that time. Mm -hmm. And you can see that there are these consistent periods of time. Well, if you take seven archangels and you multiply them times approximately 300, between 300 and 360, you get 2,160. And when you multiply that, and that is, of course, one of these large periods of time that Steiner describes. And if you multiply that times 12, that's called the Platonic year, 25,920 years. That's the procession of the equinox. That's the sun rising at the vernal equinox, on, in other words, the first day of spring. Every year goes one degree back. And once you go all the way around 
and come all the way back, it comes to 25,920. All the ancients tried to build that into their buildings. They tried to say that we know this. We are in communication with the cosmos. We know the divine plan. We know the epochs. We know the planetary incarnations. We know the cultural ages. We know the periods. We know the archangelic regencies. And therefore, you can know all kinds of things because you know the archetypes that are manifesting them. And this is what we're going to try to, that's what we've shared in this book, is there's commentary in this book that tries to explain these things. But really, it was the Christian community priests studying the apocalypse where Rudolf Steiner gave this, the greatest secrets about the future. And I can literally say to you, besides the few books written by the Christian community priests, there are very, very few anthroposophists who have a clue about this. And as I mentioned before, even one of the greatest anthroposophists made the mistake. And that's why in this book, the subtitle is Preparing for the Future Sixth and Seventh Epochs. Now, the reason John and I both laughed when we said this is that's epochs. That's not cultural periods. That's not the um, ancient India, ancient Persia, ancient Egypt, Chaldea, Samaria. That's one. Ancient Greece. And now our age, Anglo-Germanic. Okay, so we have gone through these cultural periods and we still have two more to go because we're in the fifth one. We're in the fourth great planetary incarnation of the earth. We're in the fifth post-Atlantean period, but we are, we've gone through the Indian, Persian, Egyptian, Greco-Roman, and now we're in the Anglo-Germanic. But in the future, we have two more. That would be sixth and seventh. Well, the pendulum starts to lose some of its force, doesn't it? Once it reaches the low point, it's got a lot of force from, from uh, coming from the previous four in the fifth. But in the sixth and seventh, it becomes kind of lackadaisical. And in the seventh, what happens? It loses its force and falls back, right? So literally, you can see that in the fifth age, our age, we are implanting the, the new seed of culture. We are implanting the new impulse. But that impulse will grow old in the sixth and grow stale and actually lukewarm in the seventh, Rudolf Steiner calls it. So when we talk about the future, most people will say, oh, the war of all against all, because that's in the apocalypse, right? And so the descriptions in the apocalypse. And so people say, oh, the war of all against all. Oh my gosh, that's the end of it all. The moon will reunite with the earth in 8,000, supposedly a little bit before 8,000 AD. Uh, and people think, oh, that's the end. Then we're angels. No, you got another 30,000 years to go. And that first war of all against all is one of the two that are going to happen. So as we go into the sixth and seventh cultural periods, which Rudolf Steiner calls the Russian Slavic or the Eastern Europe, that's the sixth period. He also calls that the description given is from the apocalypse that's called the period of Philadelphia. And then the period of uh, Laodicea would be the seventh period, which he calls the American period. And then we have the war of all against all. So people get really worked up about all of this. And we started writing, oh, about a year and a half ago to say that the apocalypse is not a sad story. The apocalypse is a victory story. And there, the rapture, why are you waiting for the rapture? It's already happened. And it will happen again when you die. And it will actually happen every time you go to sleep. And it happens every time you can meditate consciously and go into the spiritual world. So this harvesting that's described, which some people call the rapture, which there is no rapture, the good people are left. We go through the thousand years of tribulation. And Steiner describes that in great detail. We are in the fifth age of the vials of wrath. And you can look and see that that is happening. All of them are happening now. Just the description is exactly right. And if you want to talk about the previous incarnations of the earth, you look at the letters to the churches in the apocalypse. It describes them. It describes what happens in those. Then it describes what happens in our time. And then it describes what happens in the sixth cultural age or called post-Atlantean period. So it'd be called the sixth 
post-Atlantean period and the seventh post-Atlantean period. And then at the end of that, then we go into a transition into, uh, excuse me, I, I just said that wrong. That's how, uh, how you have to be so careful. The Russian, so if we call it the Russian and the American age, okay? And then there is the war of all against all. But then we still have the sixth and the seventh. And Steiner describes them in great detail. But people get these so confused. They, they make the descriptions of the sixth cultural age, the descriptions of the sixth epoch. And that's the reason I believe no one yet has ever attempted to make this clear for people who are anthroposophists. So this book is not just for people who are new to anthroposophy. It's for the deepest anthroposophists out there. And we challenge you. We challenge you. If you find a mistake in our presentation here, please let us know because we're going to go back to these charts because John and I took previous charts other people did and we made them better and we added to them. And, and this is a 10 page document. John's charts in his book. I don't know how many charts are in there. These seven charts that are in here will get you going. It will get, there are seven principal diagrams that will actually, if you meditate on these, will take you out of the sense perceptible world. And most of our thoughts come from words that are derived from labeling the sense perceptible world. But if you can get into super sensible perception, you can project this, these ideas in your mind into the future and you can start to absorb them yourself. And that gets really dicey. I think I'll save that till next time. But how is it that you can literally communicate with your guardian angel? And who is that guardian angel? Can you communicate with Michael, the, arch the archangel who's the archive, the time spirit? Can you communicate with Michael right now? How do you do that? And how do you communicate with the beings that are beyond that? And how do you build? Steiner gives you exact descriptions of everything that you do from breathing to your heartbeat, to the food you digest, to the words you speak, to the thoughts you have. Those build the future heaven. He calls future Jupiter or in the Bible, it's called the new Jerusalem. And the descriptions are exact. So as a person who studied this pretty much all my life, I can tell you that until Rudolf Steiner's descriptions, finally it sunk into me. It only took 40 years, but they finally sunk into me. And I finally said, oh, I think he means this. <laughs> so I call up my good friend, John Barnwell and say, John, you know, what do you think about this? And so we started working on this project and literally I don't think there's any more difficult project I have ever had than sorting this out and putting it in this book, How to Become an Angel. Yeah, it, see, what you have to do is, is you have to grapple with the concepts of time and of space. And the mystery of space is a 12-fold mystery. So that's your zodiac, just as a cube has 12 edges. Now, the mystery of time is sevenfold. So you'll see, even in the stages of metamorphosis of a butterfly, there's seven stages. It gets to, and it's fascinating because really, uh, you wouldn't think it would get where it did. Because if you look at a caterpillar and it goes into this state, and then there's what's called the imago. Okay, it's just a word they give to that something happens, and all of a sudden this thing goes into a basically kind of a viscous fluid state. And then when it comes out of the fluid state, it looks like a butterfly and it breaks out of the cocoon. So there's really nothing there to give you a clue to understand this metamorphosis. And it's really key understanding that word metamorphosis because that really connects Rudolf Steiner to the work of the author of Faust, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. But if you're getting into understanding this, this cycle of 25,920, it's a human cycle. So on average, you take 25,920 breaths in a day. Your pulse beat is 72. The precession of the equinox moves one degree of the, of the 360 degree zodiac every 72 years. So it's expressed all over the place. And so when you go to these ages that we're talking about, which 
Rudelsteiner designates them as the post-Atlantean period. So you have the sinking of Atlantis, and then you have the beginning of the age of cancer in 7,227 BC, right? And it goes for 2,160 years. And then it goes to the Persian period, and then the Egypto-Chaldean, and then the Greco-Roman, and then into our current uh, period of time where we have the consciousness soul. Now, these 2,160-year uh, cycles, to try and sort that out and separate that from what are called epochs. Okay, so the, the Atlantean period, that's an epoch. The post-Atlantean period, of which we're in the fifth stage of, that is the post-Atlantean epoch. And that goes from 7,227 BC to 38,134 AD. So if you can make sense of, of these great cycles, you can come to a deeper understanding of the esoteric Christianity that's put forward by Rudolf Steiner. And so I salute Douglas. Truly, we literally have spent a lifetime trying to sort these details out because when you get the books, the translators are not consistent amongst each other as to which term they use for any particular thing. So they start talk, calling periods epochs, and you think that they're talking about the, the, the roughly 15,000-year cycle. And no, they're talking about the 2,160-year cycle. So it's really easy to get confused. So I have a great deal of compassion for people that try to approach this material. Yes, and um, here's another one, okay? And, and, and it's just as accurate as the other one, and yet they're not going to describe one single thing on it because <laughs> they can't. When we started, uh, many friends of mine, when we started at the, uh, the Waldorf Institute, Rick Knudsen was one of the people. You know Rick very well, John, and uh, his brother, uh, Cecil, and he is an engineer, so they had this uh, big table, a big dining table, and they put a huge piece of paper on it, and they started marking all this up and putting in all the details. Tiny, tiny little writing. He spent a whole year on this thing, and it was never finished. Why? Because there's that many details. So the problem is, if you're a cosmologist, you might get caught up in the details, and then you might think that you understand them because you're a picture of it, is better than the other person's picture of it. And the anthropologist would say, don't use any charts. That's going to really mess you up because a chart is going to make it look like you understand it. And that's the trick. A lot of these people have a chart. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but the great commentator uh, of Rudolf Steiner, he has a chart and yet he uses wrong terms. I don't know even where he got some of those terms and some of the things are incorrect in it. I just saw one on Facebook where the person had it all mixed up and it was just a mishmash. But if it's a cosmology and you're not describing it and you're not describing what happens to the human being in, in the metamorphosis that happens in this process, then all it is is words on a page. So the problem is you need to take the words on the page, fill them in like uh, Dank Barbosi did uh, as this geologist. And when you do, you'll find Steiner's absolutely right, correct? When you take what, for instance, Gunther Voxmuth put in The Evolution of Mankind, he clearly shows that Steiner was the first person ever to point out that when Lemuria sank, and it was uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean, when it sank, the migration went across Africa and stopped at three places. These are the three places that the theory uh, out of Africa or the uh, eve of Africa it says that the oldest cultures that we have of the modern human being were, were found in these three exact spots that Rudolf Steiner had said. So you can go back to these books and find that prophecies that Steiner made back then are now being fulfilled with detail that prove that he's correct. Now, the problem is when people start talking about the future, they get freaked out. There's no Christian community priest that I know of, and I've known a lot of them and very close to them, many of them. Never once will they speak about how to become an angel. Never once will they speak about what a human being is going to become in the future or what 
these scary details that Steiner gives, which we'll talk about next once John has something to say, uh, because these scary details are enough to shake you up, but they're there to shake you up on a purpose so that they put a fire to your feet so you start doing some spiritual development and trying to learn what the divine plan is and learn the language of the spirit so you can communicate with these beings who are anxious to communicate with you. Yeah, Rudolf Steiner described his uh, really central work, uh, the outline of esoteric science or occult science, or there's, it's been published under various names, but he said that this is, this is the Christ language. This is the language that one needs to learn to be able to commune with the divine spiritual beings because because this is basically the loom of creation. This is the warp and woof of the time and space continuum that we're, we're unfolding within. And, and there's footprints of it all over the place. I mean, I remember uh, uh, with Christopher Strunk, we were, uh, Douglas, we were discussing uh, a particular island in, in between the uh, Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And we went and looked at the flag and on the flag, it says Lemuria. <laughs> <laughs> and it's part of the British Commonwealth. So these things are, are known more widely than one would suspect, but there are certain circles of people that think that they want to keep it private. They don't, they don't want you to know. Well, I, we'd, li we'd like to let you know that if you want to find out, it's available. And there's a great many videos of Rudolf Steiner's books available, of course, on YouTube. And, and that's wonderful, but it's such a huge body of work. And that's only a partial display of his work, of part of what's been translated into English, so that's some 350 plus volumes of material. And so what we, we try to do is help people be able to find their way through this uh, really just incredible process. Uh, palette of creativity, but keeping in mind that Rudolf Steiner once said that if one overly concerns oneself with the wisdom aspect of it, that they miss out on the beauty aspect of it, and that they're not building their etheric body for the future if they're not concerning themselves with beauty, so that it's important to participate artistically in this, that this should be approached in an artistic way and through it's nice to include that art, whether it be painting, sculpture, music, dance, what have you. These beautiful things that we can add to the world around us to make the world a better place. So true. Well said. And we have a book that is now up on Amazon called Surviving the Apocalypse, as I mentioned before. It is how to get through the immediate times. And, oh, there you go. There's a picture of it. Surviving the Apocalypse creating your arc. And we've been discussing this for years and we put out many, many things on it. But the point is that's kind of in the near future. So if you're a bit fearful of getting through what seems to be the tribulation and the vials of wrath that we are in, we absolutely are in the vials of wrath, uh, then you need to take a look at that book and that'll give you some comfort, but then you need to look further on. If you look further on, you're going to see that there's a bifurcation of humanity. There's going to be a good humanity and a bad humanity. In the future, whenever you incarnate, all of your good and bad deeds will be written on your face and with your own physiognomy. So you can look at a person in, let's just say, the next incarnation or the incarnation after that, they won't have to speak to, for them to let you know whether they're good or evil. It will be written on their face. And there will be vehicles that will be so turned to evil that there'll be very few for the people who Steiner calls the remnant or those that some would call the raptured or those who are harvested in, in the description in the apocalypse. Well, those people are going to be wearing the white tunic. They're going to be uh, preaching the eternal gospel. In other words, that we're immortal beings. We are not materialistic beings who are going to nihilist nihilistically die into a cold, dead grave. And that's the end of entropy. No, we are immortal beings. And once you know that, you preach the eternal gospel and you sing the new song, the new song of the Lamb or of Judah. And what is that song? 
Well, what you're preaching, what you're saying, what you're singing, what you're seeing, the fact that you, you're dressed in a white tunic shows that all three realms of the angels, archangels, and archai are acting through you. That's the good people. And the descriptions are very clear what happens with them. It's just that people ignore them. Read to the end of the book of St. John's uh, Revelation, and you will find that it is a victory story. But you can go on the internet and you can go on Facebook or anywhere on the internet and you're going to find people preaching about the eighth sphere, which we've talked about a little bit before, uh, preaching about the Asuras, preaching about the incarnation of Araman, preaching about uh, the future and that humanity is going to be turned into basically the good magicians, the pseudo angel people and the black magicians who then control the people who Steiner calls the slug people who are just basically crawling around in the mud of their own bad karma or insect people. Uh, he gives very specific names for these. I'm not going to mention it because I once got a, a video kicked off for saying these words. So I'm sure that I'm not, I'd get flagged if I said them. It's in the book. But you can read the scariest things about the future in this book. And that's right. If you think it is, if you think it is a, a, a walk down a primrose path, you are severely mistaken. Our job is to develop an ego. Well, what's the first thing that a human does when they get an ego? They become selfish. And they go the path of perdition of the seven deadly sins, which basically uh, are, is a Luciferic delusion and an Aramonic imprisonment. That's what we do. And so what's going to happen in the future? If we can't confront evil and discern it and tell it to get behind us and not be part of it and not, again, be another fallen rank of the hierarchy, then we need to develop our relationship with our own guardian angel which is our own angel. It's our own spirit self, Rudolf Steiner calls it. And so that is the task of the future. There may be nasty things coming for some people who are going to devolve, but there's wonderful things happening. Now, here's the problem. People think, uh, yeah, I'm really highly advanced. I, I'm not going to reincarnate anymore. Uh, no, you are, because even if you were highly advanced, you'd have this task. You'd become a guardian angel. You start looking after the people who aren't angels. Of course, that's what you would do. That would be the Christ thing to do. If you're going to be a Christ and human ego, you are going to try to pull those people up out of the mud. And so in the future, Steiner describes this new heaven, but there's also a hell there. And uh, we will discuss the, that further in terms of the different ways that that looks in terms of the solar system's manifestation of planets and the sun and the moons and there's distinctions. So you hear people constantly talking about the eighth sphere, but they don't know what that is. The eighth sphere is the slag of the earth incarnation that isn't going to make it. It's not going to evolve. It's basically going to be um, the throwaway trash of the earth, which is what so many people who are evil on the earth want to do is turn the earth into a big trash can. And then they think they're going to leave it and either go to another planet or even the spiritual people, spiritual materialists think, I'm going to become an angel. I'm getting out of here. No, we are going to take everything and redeem it. Even the demons and the devils and uh, all negativity. It is up to us in the future, not now, but in the future to redeem evil and to turn it into the new Eden called New Jerusalem, or as Steiner calls it, Shambhala. Uh, he has many other names for it. So our job is simply to be pure of heart, to open our eyes, our ears, and our heart, and our actions to the spiritual world, and become the eyes, ears, hands, and heart of the divine on the earth. And as we do that, then angels start to communicate with us, and we communicate with them. And what will they tell us? Exactly what you're going to find in this book that because Steiner could, he wasn't limited by space and time. He was one of those amazing, extraordinary beings that could see the future. Rudolf Steiner makes reference to, he says, uh, even higher mystery than Rosicrucianism is Monarchyism. And that's the redemption of evil through mildness. And that's a difficult lesson to learn, but we always have to keep in mind the, the translation of the word gospel. What, is, what does gospel mean? It means 
good news. <laughs>